to paralytes. Mm. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing those. Uh, I mean, I feel like that passion needs to be present in, in our policies. Uh, and if they're not, you know, like we need to just check to make sure that they're in tune with the crisis that we're looking to solve. Uh, people are dying uh, every day as a result of this crisis. Um, and so what are we doing uh, to act with urgency? Yeah. Thank you, Karen. Peter, did you have your hand up? Did you want yeah, to I, I, I wanted to respond to the, uh, to the earlier request about um, continuum of care collaboration and continuum of care board collaboration, which I, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a really interesting one. And I saw the comment from Ben, um, Dan, when, you know, I, I'm, I came up to King County from Los Angeles and in LA, so LA County is one large continuum, but there are two smaller continuums and you know, three cities within the continuum each have their own continuum. So Long Beach, Pasadena, Glendale, those cities in LA County have their own. So we would collaborate with them. But then locally across Southern California, there was also a group that pulled together all the continuums and we would sit down on a kind of regular basis. So, you know, I think, you know, I would like to, I will work with our colleagues in the other continuums in, in Western Washington to see if we can create a table like that where, you know, you know, we can all sort of talk through. Now, sometimes obviously, you know, like we're also in competition, which is a little bit that Marvin, that's one of your points that you were making. It's like, we're, we're competing locally with the providers, but also we're competing against these other COCs for resources during the NOFO. But after the NOFO, honestly, we would sit down and we would all sort of show our hands and we'd say like, I, I scored, okay, this is my score on this section and this is how I got there. So that we're trying to, you know, not in the middle of the competition, but after the competition, we could all sort of help each other, you know, move the whole region forward. And that's something that we can, we can take on and, and work with and, and see if we can stand up a collaboration with the other continuums. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for that example. I know there's lots of different pockets where different communities come together and have those conversations. And I think it also plays on to some of the pieces that Tamara was raising around policy and like how are you as a joint continuum of care aligning for some of to push some of those objectives too right so there's like the operations and planning piece that that Peter's like elevating and navigating and there's the policy piece of like how are you as a community talking about because you are not alone in doing sweeps and rehousing people from encampments and forcing them to move how are different communities navigating that right um uh so yeah I, those, those places can be a great opportunity for dialogue across different communities. Yeah, does someone else have their hand up? Sorry, I don't see your name. Um, just going back to Tamara's point about, you know, statements and values, I think it would be nice for us as a board to maybe have a, a meeting where we actually have a conversation about what are our values as a board that we jointly believe in, come up with our values in a statement and have the statement be reflected on the website to show what we believe in. And I think that could be one of the things that we could do. Great. Great suggestion. All right. Um, let's keep us moving. Um, uh, so we actually talked a little bit about some of this already, um, but there are specific things we think about as we talk about what does it mean to maximize the resources within your continuum of care. Um, and so this is really, uh, and th this is maybe an opportunity, Kay, I don't want to put you too much on the spot, but I know this is constantly happening as we think about kind of what do you rank, and, uh, what do you rate and rank within your continuum of care process? And also how do you think about reallocation? Um, and so I don't know if you wanted to take a moment to just talk about this or maybe just queue it up for a different conversation. I don't want to put you on the spot, but um, I know that the community navigates this differently. Um, I didn't know if you had a comment here or not, if we should keep moving and circle back to that. Now, um, I can speak briefly and again in previous presentations and we can come back to this in more detail at future meetings as is appropriate. Um, but we do have, always have a sort of a, a scoring rubric that we use. We look at performance against 
elements that are important to HUD because we know these are federal HUD resources, but we also need to look at what are our local priorities. So we start with our score based using information out of the HMIS. Historically, we've had a local application where we have people speak to things like, how do you involve your participants in decision making or respond to uh, participant needs and have some questions like that as well. We come up with a score based rank order and then think about other elements within our community. Um, is this the only program serving young adults in King County? Is this a really important, unique program for some reason to sort of get a sense of funding and then looking at how programs are performing, looking at uh, history over a number of years. Is this a one year fluke and we know what happened or are we seeing a pattern here? Uh, and looking at the dollars and how we might be re able to reallocate them in new projects that meet our needs, again, within the relatively narrow framework that HUD gives us in terms of what we can actually reallocate it to. So there's always that tension between what we might want to do more broadly and what we can do specifically with the HUD continuum of care dollars. So always remembering we want to leverage these dollars, use them as best we can, and maybe some of the things we really want to do, we need to look to other dollars for. Um, and then uh, the reallocation process, again, as we've done that historically, um, based on what we're able to use them for, connected to sort of a local process that rates and ranks and lets us know what projects might be that need. Um, so I'm just sort of talking words, but you may recall several times over the last year where we've come and shown sort of our, our rating tool and how we come up with a priority order for the project. That's how we've handled it historically. Thanks, Kate. It does bring to mind whether or not we figure if there are, are ways or opportunities, and I'm going to circle back to an earlier question when we want to maximize response versus maximizing dollars, you know, how, where are opportunities with HUD at bringing in these otherwise unique organizations or, or programs that uh, could definitely use the funding, you know? We use the term narrow, I hear the term narrow all the time, but it's not definitive enough of being able to, hopefully, if we're talking about this, where are the gaps? Where are the chances? Where are the opportunities for that uh, systemic change or, you know, introduction of new new responses? I'll give that to anyone. I, I will just say, Marvin, that I think that that that, that question is uh, something that COCs wrestle with on a like especially ones that have like large programs they've been funding for decades around how do you think about change? How do you think about change in a rather set like pool of resources uh, when your community is looking to accomplish different things? Um, so you have like a limited amount of resources that you're moving around and, and the challenge of, is it worth the impact of removing resources to invest in something different that's focused in on the priorities that you might elevate as a local uh, as a local board. So it's a it's a really important question. I'll I'll pick up on I'll pick up on what was uh, just said. Thank you, Marvin. Um, I'm uh, listening very intently, and I'm. Um, I have lots of questions, but this is one from what Marvin just raised and what you just said, um, uh, Derek. So um, you have a large organization um, that is meeting the, um, seems to be meeting the benchmarks and seems to be high performing, um, offering lots of bed nights and all of this. And then you have another organization that's smaller is trying to get in. And I, I uh, philosophically have a problem with it being uh, contextualized as a competition, mm -hmm. especially when it comes down to the lives of folks who are unhoused. Um, but as a um, advisory committee, 
it's really important for us to understand what our power is, because if in fact we we have to honor that we are a volunteer board, whereas this work had been performed by paid staff previously, we have a huge learning curve where we're trying to learn not only what we are empowered to do, but how to do it, and also the background information um, for decades at this point. And so there, there are um, some questions that are coming across as provocative, but really I think it's a necessary change because we're on the other side of a 10 year um, <laughs> promise to end homelessness, right? Yeah. Several years out from that. And so would we be empowered as an advisory committee, for instance, to say this organization has been getting funding for 15 years and yes, they are considered high performing, However, they have not run themselves out of business. So how can we put time limits? <laughs> Would we be empowered to do that? To say organization A has been getting money for 15 years and they have two years to, to be showing some kind of measure that we create or we're going to be um, progressively reducing the amount of money so that it goes to smaller organizations that are doing unique um, programming. I'm, I'm just wondering because as much as we try to dance on this sort of um, partisan political line, we are very political in terms of who get keeps getting these dollars. Mm -hmm. We are very political about mm -hmm. the fact that, um, uh, m you know, of the organizations that um, we fund, I think we should have a measure as to how many of the executive directors are making six figures how many of them are dominant culture or white? Mm -hmm. How many of them are minoritized um, executive directors, which I would say in Seattle are very few. Mm -hmm. what, is, what, is, what are the ways that there are, are evaluative pieces in the assessments so that there's a reduction in um, what we know are, are, is, is a lack of equity in terms of who gets even into uh, low um, um, programs where there's low thresholds. So there's there's a lot of things that we can do, but this is truly about learning what we are legitimately allowed to do. So I know I put a lot out there, but I'm ready to get to the meat <laughs> where, oh, wow. where we can say, okay, this organization, yeah, they're shiny. They've got lots of trucks. They've got lots of places. But if there is a um, a person who is indigenous over the age of sixty, will they be treated with equity? Will they get the 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 um, resources they need? And will they get bed nights, or are they actually getting housing in their own name that will benefit them? Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's that's what I'm really trying to get down to. Yeah, I, I think those, uh, you know, Dr. Brown, I think those are like the questions. Like, so um, I, I will not say what you can and cannot do. I think what I'm elevating is like, this is the minimum threshold from HUD around what your expectations are, how you get specific, how you create like applications for funding that target in on BIPOC led organizations or other places. That's all local process, right? And okay. I do think it's important to also start having conversations with like your field office and other HUD people who are gonna be kind of your, your stewards of your resources alongside you that are gonna be, um, I would say the more you turn them into advocates alongside the goals that you're hoping to accomplish, the more successful your work can be. But sure. like, but, but uh, I think those are like such phenomenal questions. And I really think it's important to think about that in your local process. Uh, and think about what are the things you need to vet and navigate through uh, to make sure that people don't prohibit that from happening. And I don't know what those are, right? Like, so I think it's just talking locally. If you meet the basic thresholds that I'm walking through here, you're meeting HUD's expectations. Uh, and then the next layer is what are the ways you target in and prioritize the work that you want to accomplish? Um, and, and I think that's the work that you're looking forward to dig into. I feel like I talked around and answered because I think those are wonderful questions and each of them take time to sure. parse apart. Um, but I, I appreciate it. But you've given some um, you've given some direction that if we're meeting the minimum requirement, that there's a whole wealth of things that we can do 
um, beyond that to try to infuse equity and justice into this process. And, you know, I, I believe in advocacy. Um, and I also believe um, that um, sometimes um, organizationally people who go along to get along end up participating mm -hmm. and, and becoming um, um, a part of the uh, uh, complicit in, in terms of, of um, the lack of movement. So I think um, we, we'll have to do a dance there, but I thank you for saying that if we meet the, the basic requirements for HUD, we have a, an ability to create a universe of um, policy unique to this uh, COC that can hopefully um, begin to make some changes. Um, yep for folks who are experiencing homelessness and beyond. Yeah, and one of the things, so I'm making a list of stuff to send you all afterwards. One of them is honestly like, use the regulations as a tool. Uh, and I say that to say like, this is gonna be how HUD is gonna say whether or not it is and isn't allowed. And if you navigate those regulations and can say like, per regulation, blah, 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 this is all the stuff like reading through those regs and speak that language, it's much more like, again, it's just using the regulations for the goals that you're wanting uh, to accomplish. Um, that's the HUD language, right? Uh, and so I think being able uh, to get through some of those and build on top of it towards the goal that your community has uh, is, is a, a really good strategy. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you for asking that. So really quickly, uh, Derek, I'm sorry, yeah. does someone else want to speak? Okay, uh, my question is real quick. Uh, I believe we are in, in Region 10, HUD Region 10. I just don't know what local HUD, where, where the local HUD folks are. Yeah, that's another great, um, I'll definitely put that on our list to follow up of like, who's your regional off, who's your staff, who's your CPD director? Uh, that's just basically like, who's the overseeing the whole region? Who's the staff that's working with you? Kate, I don't know if you know that off the top of your hand, you're way better at the local stuff, but um, we can send that that link afterwards. Thank you. Uh, it's public, yeah. Yeah, the local, the, we, we've been working, look, you know, with the local field office and, and the, you know, the reps there, as well as with the SNAP's office team. So, Great. um, point of clarification, we're going to expand that word. We, the continuum of care board will hopefully begin having more direct conversations with that group, but thank you. It's nice to know that we know who they are. Cool. Thanks, Mr. Ben. All right, let's keep moving. Um, oh, yep. Sorry, did someone, Marvin, did you want to jump in? I'm done. Yes, okay. please continue. Yeah. Oops, let's go back. Um, so uh, we talked, Kate mentioned this a little bit. Um, so this is just some of the specifics around project ranking and selection. Um, so in the application, here are some things that HUD is saying that you must have included. Um, and so again, I'll, you'll get this resource afterwards. I can read through it a little bit just to hear some of the words, but I think it's a good thing to read through afterwards just to familiarize yourself with some of the basics. Um, but the, in the application, uh, you must inter indicate whether the COC use objective criteria to review, rank, rank, and select projects for funding. Um, and I, I would honestly connect back to some of the other questions around what do you mean by object, objectivity in your community, right? There's a whole lot behind that word, right? So um, spend some time uh, being specific about what the criteria you were used were. Um, so uh, indicate whether the COC included one factor related to achieve the positive housing outcomes, um, indicate whether the continuum of care, care included a specific method for evaluating projects submitted um, by victim service providers that utilize data generated uh, from a comparable database. So this is just all saying that um, victim service organizations have an ability um, to anonymize their data and put that in a comparable database uh, to protect the individual's identity. Uh, and so just kind of what's the process that your community has included uh, to evaluate projects such as those. Um, and then um, you've attached evidence that supports the process that you all used and selected, right? Um, 
So those are some of the things that as you think about in the application that HUD is saying you must include. Um, so um, there are also some things that we talk about minimum thresholds, right? Um, so these are some things that HUD's saying you have to have your applicants do or they're not eligible to receive continuum of care funding. Um, so again, read through some of these. Um, I'm sure this is uh, a lot of the stuff that's been built into your continuum of care applications over the years, um, but they must participate in coordinated entry. Uh, they have to uh, agree to adhere to a housing first and or low barrier implementation. Um, and they have to document and secure their minimum match amount, which means if they're funded at a certain amount, HUD is expecting a match that is articulated, meaning other funding that is coming in to support that funding from HUD uh, to accomplish the same kind of goals. Um, so they have to document that they've secured that match. Um, and the project has reasonable cost per permanent housing exit as defined locally, right? So this is all just talking about uh, what is the cost effectiveness of the resources that you're allocating out. Um, and that this is a big one, but uh, you define this uh, locally as to your project is financially feasible. Um, so just what does that mean to be financially feasible in your continuum of care? Uh, I know that that's gonna be different for continuums across the country. Um, your applicant is an active COC participant, so they're engaged in your continuum of care. Um, the application is complete and the data is consistent throughout the application. Um, their data quality, so their history of entering data into your homeless management information system is at or above 90%. Um, your bed utilization rate, uh, so this is meaning those units uh, are um, their bed units are at or above 90% utilized. Um, there is acceptable organizational audit or review information, um, and then equally a documented organizational financial stability. Um, so just how are they documenting that their, their organization is financially stable? Um, so um, there is some ways to interpret some of that information, but these are some of the thresholds uh, that HUD has for uh, applicants within a COC. Um, did I miss any questions in the chat? Okay. Derek, the only thing, sorry, the only thing that I would add to this is that, hi, thanks, sorry, uh, I'll introduce myself. Hi everyone, Susan Starrett, she, her, I uh, work with Derek at CSH, sorry to be late, I was in the mandatory training, um, so uh, hopped on over. Uh, the only thing that I would add to this is that this list may change when the next continuum of care notice of funding opportunity uh, is released. So I think it's just really important to make sure that you're reading that NOFO when it comes out, uh, because sometimes these get updated uh, and numbers might change or things might get added to them. Thanks, Susan. Um, so um, this is where we get into, within that ranking, uh, the rating and ranking process, um, you have like some performance targets that you're setting. Um, so this actually gets to some of uh, the different things I think uh, Tamara was raising earlier around uh, the benchmarks within rapid rehousing around when people need to be housed and uh, the length of time. But on average setting um, your different uh, benchmarks, uh, but then also this is where we get into the specific system performance measures that HUD is going to be tracking and looking at very specifically, right? So uh, what you will hear called SPMs or system performance measures um, are four critical elements within your overall system that you as a board should be looking at and thinking about. Uh, and this is across your system, right? Now, it's, in, it's important to think about that organizationally, but as you think about this across your entire continuum of care, uh, what does your length of stay look like? So how long are individuals in your programs? What is your percentage of exits to permanent housing? How many of the people that leave your system are returning back into homelessness? Um, and then what is that increase in income or earned income look like, right? 
Um, so those are four system performance measures that HUD is going to be looking at when you look at when you turn in your uh, annual performance reports. Uh, and it's important stuff to be thinking about for your continuum of care in a regular right? Um, so I don't know, Susan, if you would add anything to either of those uh, elements just to give some more context. Sure. Um, so we should be looking at these at both the project level and at the system level. As Derek said, at the system level, they're called system performance measures. You're, uh, you have to every year submit data for the six defined system performance measures to HUD. And from year to year, you're looking at your community's individual progress on those performance measures. You are not being scored across other COCs. You're not looking right like they're not comparing King County to Washington or D, you know New York or whatever. Um, it's from year to year your progress on the system performance measures at the project level, uh, right? Setting those targets for projects that should be included in your written standards, which we have a slide on later. Uh, but documenting what those performance targets are, uh, and then you can use those when you're looking at the re uh, renewal applications uh, to see how well individual applicants or individual projects are doing. Um, so uh, just making sure that everything is documented and that it's transparent about how uh, what the performance targets are that as a continuum of care, you want projects to be reaching uh, so that then when you're going to evaluate them on their performance, uh, it's pretty transparent and they should know before they even submit their project application where they're going to score on uh, those performance measures. Thank you. Really quickly, I'm going to circle back to my original question is in the competitive nature more and more money has been put to ending homelessness with the outcome actually being more people experiencing homelessness and has nothing to do with the work that has in some cases folks have been doing it seems to be a systemic inability to uh address being able to address the needs given uh a continuum of care's uh, work area without lowering its value to the point that it gets no support whatsoever. Uh, the challenge is where are the opportunities for change and that's systemic change. And that's where the challenge to what is being asked as an outcome, uh, you know, be changed or reworded or reevaluated or reinterpreted. For, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, I, um, thank you uh, for that question. And I'm sorry that I missed that earlier. Um, you know, I think uh, solving systemic issues don't typically happen at an individual project level, right? So uh, focusing in on projects, but also at the system and your system performance. Um, trying not to approach things from a scarcity mindset, um, but really looking at the assets of your system uh, and building upon those assets. Uh, you know, um, kind of when we think about a system, one of the illustrations that folks use for a system is a, um, like a bathtub. What's a, excuse me, I need a literacy moment. What do you mean by a scarcity, whatever you said, mindset? Yeah. What does that mean? No, thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, so scarcity mindset is that we don't have enough resources and we're never going to have enough resources. Therefore, we have to really focus in and target what it is that we do because we don't have enough. And to right, like it's pretty like deficit based, right? It's uh, kind of always thinking about the negative side of it um, and uh, thinking about things from a strength side and an asset uh, based model where we're looking at like, what are we doing really well? How can we improve upon that? Uh, how can we do more of that? 
Um, and I think that that's well, I part think of some of us don't have that mindset because we know what some of these agencies and entities have reported as going well is nothing but false pretenses because we've experienced that ourselves, right? And mm -hmm. we know that it's fake and phony. So that trust, that rapport is not there to be able to rely on what they're reporting. You know what I'm saying? Even my own agency that I work for is phony ass reports. You know what I'm saying? So that that has a lack of trust, a lack of accountability to them. You know what I mean? That some of us and some of the people that we represent feel um, is lacking, right? And they don't want to kind of, they, they feel like there isn't uh, um, in some way strengths, right? Because those strengths are, are based on false um, things, false presentations. And, and uh, you know, adding to that also, you know, thank you so much for raising that. And, and I think uh, this gets back to some of the other things that were raised around policies in your community around criminalization of homelessness and some of the challenges. It's looked at as punishment or punitive impacts rather than seeing the skills and assets and amazing abilities of all of the individuals in your community and being able to build on those. Far too often, punishments are brought in uh, or repercussions are brought in because people don't have housing. And so thinking about what are all the assets, skills, strengths that every individual in the community brings to your system? Um, and how do we think about that wealth of resources um, and leverage and activate those, right? Like those are all, like there's no magic answer there, but like it is changing a culture. It is thinking about your system differently. And then I would also say it's pushing HUD to think differently, right? So you're talking about advocacy and policy around how do you start moving some of the benchmarks for HUD and having some of those conversations, it's engaging in the dialogue with HUD too to talk about how you want to enhance systems that are strength-based, how you wanna build on the assets and the amazing abilities of all the people within your system while still driving more housing resources, right? Um, so yeah, I think that all of the, like, you have the basis, basic X's and O's that Susan and I are walking through on regulations from HUD and you are getting into what is the culture you are creating together that is a system that operates differently? And that takes time to change. Uh, and there's this urgency because people are dying every day, you know? And so like, how do we, how do we act with that urgency um, to be rooted in the strength-based uh, way that we wanna think about this while still understanding that that's not how our system operates right now, but that we want it to change. I don't know if folks can see Christy's comments in the chat. Um, Christy, I think you're only sending to hosts and panelists instead of to everyone, but um, if it's okay, I'm gonna uh, just read um, uh, something that you put in around funding is based on quality metrics. And I like I wanna recognize that this slide is only showing quantitative data, which I think goes to the point that was being made earlier as well, and that there's a quality aspect to this. HUD is very quantitative based. That does not mean that you all have to only think about quantitative data as well. Um, and that looking at and defining what quality means in your community is hugely important um, to to being able to meet the outcomes that you all are talking about and that you're you know, putting into the chat and saying. Um, and so again, this is right, like we're showing the minimum, uh, please, please go beyond that because uh, that's, we're not preventing and ending homelessness by just doing the minimum of what HUD says. All right. We can keep us moving. So we talked a little bit about um, also partnerships and collaborations and all of the different partners in your community, right? So um, we're gonna, you know, we have a number of these different examples up here of what collaborations look like and some of the reasons why. Um, again, um, we you're gonna get these slides afterwards. Um, and so you'll have these as well as some more information from Susan and myself, um, but like, how are you thinking about who your system partners are and how they're engaged, how they're engaged in like the important conversations that you're having today and some of those like philosophical groundings and rootings that you wanna have for your board. Um, and then what does that mean um, to have a regular engagement, right? Um, and so 
thinking about that at both the policy and the practice level for partnerships, right? So how are you approaching uh, addressing the different housing needs at a policy level, but also addressing that in your partnerships with those that have received funding? Um, and so thinking about having more active engagement and uh, you know not thinking about just sporadic like presentations, but more, much more deep partnerships. And how is that possible when you have the myriad of partnerships across the community um, that you're working to build into? Uh, yeah, I see someone's hands up. Yeah, just really quick. Also just for us to think about how do we embed the voice of people that are homeless that are accessing the services. So how do we make sure that we create a system to really get the feedback from communities, from people that are experiencing homelessness as they are trying to get access to these programs? I think that's critical to, to being able to assess uh, success, but also barriers within the system. I think, I think it's a great point and building on to that, how are you creating multiple different ways to hear from people, right? Um, and so what are the different mechanisms uh, and, and thinking and hearing directly from, from people about what are those ways that they feel comfortable and safe to tell their truth? Um, and how are you each then creating that space as board members uh, to hold yourselves and your community accountable to acting on the truth that you're hearing from individuals, right? Um, and so that's, that's the challenge of leadership. But, it, but it's really, really critical that those voices are present there. Absolutely. Thank you for raising that. I think it's also important as we talk about collaborations that we are thinking about um, how are you clear around the different objectives and goals of different systems and how you're figuring out how to meet them where they are while still incorporating and partnering as they join you in the effort to end homelessness in your community, right? So uh, I will talk about a lot of my work is in the youth space. Um, and so when we go and approach education systems, uh, we wanna be thinking about what are the goals and objectives that you have in the education system and how can the housing response system accompany you towards those goals and then vice versa, right? It's not simply saying, how can you help us accomplish our goals? But it's how can we mutually work together to accomplish both of our goals? Because they're each important. Um, and so how are you speaking that language to your partners that is accompanying them on their journey to success in equal measure while they're joining you, right? Um, because far too often it's like come to the table around homelessness and that's the only thing we're gonna talk about where the flip side needs to be true as well. How are you partnering with other systems and thinking about supporting them on their, on their work to accomplish the goals that they have in the community, uh, right? So some of these questions to think about are like, who are your system partners? We elevated some of them before, right? Public housing authorities, um, your, you know, your ESG districts, um, all the different things that we mentioned a little bit around HUD expectations, but your partnership so much farther. <laughs> So who are your system partners? Who are your project partners? Uh, what system goals are they responsible for? Uh, and how are they held accountable, right? Um, so all important things to think about as you build out that, um, that network and complicated network of partners. Susan, anything you would add to the collaborations work? No, I think that was great. We'll keep moving. Susan, can you take this slide a little bit? You know, walk through yeah, absolutely. So one of the um, one of the things to be thinking about in your role on the advisory committee um, and recognizing that you have subcommittees, you have work groups, you have staff at KCRHA who are working on things as well, is as a board thinking about the decision making structure uh, and. Uh, who has responsibility, who has accountability, who needs to be consulted and who needs to be informed. This is just one way of thinking about decision-making structures. Uh, uh, if it resonates with you, that's wonderful. And if it doesn't, that's okay too. Um, and, you know, uh, thinking uh, through other structures. Um, but I think uh, as uh, we thinking, think about decision-making structures, Right, and we think about each of the decision points, thinking about what your role is as the COC board, as the advisory committee, what are you ultimately responsible for? Uh, what is it that you are carrying out uh, that you're responsible to 
for making sure that that job gets done? Um, what are you accountable to or accountable for, um, which is uh, making sure that the process or task is being completed appropriately um, and typically responsible people or responsible entities are accountable to the right, like uh, entity that's identified in that accountable area. Um, some folks need uh, or groups are consulted in the process. So they may have subject matter expertise. They, you want to uh, make sure that they're getting bought in to uh, decisions. Um, uh, they are necessar not necessarily directly involved in carrying it out, but we really want to make sure that they know what's going on um, so that they can help to advocate, that they can help to uh, remove barriers, right? Like bust whatever needs to be busted, that sort of thing. Um, and then the last group are the folks who need to stay informed. Um, so they just kind of need to know what's going on. But um, yeah, uh, and for each of the roles and responsibilities that we've talked about, that Derek has talked about, for each of the, uh, you know, in that strategic planning chart that you saw and all of the things that need to happen, um, uh, who's responsible, who's accountable, who's consulted and informed. And I think really digging in on what your role is in that process um, and what do you want to have kind of uh, ownership of? What's the work that you as the board really want to take on and do together? Uh, is important to spend time in talking through that. Um, and if there's things that uh, you want to be informed about, you want to be accountable to, but not necessarily responsible for, uh, identifying who those folks are. Um, and ultimately, all of that should be in your COC governance charter um, and spelled out in there as well, um, or in a memorandum of understanding, uh, uh, or some other sort of documentation. Um, I will say in working with quite a few COC boards over the past few years, this is where kind of boards can sometimes struggle when not knowing, not having been really clear about like, this is ours we're gonna like see this through, this is our thing, right? Like we're gonna take it from beginning to end uh, versus what the staff of the collaborative applicant is working on, or the HMIS lead staff is working on, what projects are working on, um, right? So what your working groups are working on, um, can working groups make decisions or do they make recommendations and you all are the decision makers, right? So I think just spending some time uh, and making sure that you all are clear uh, in, uh, in these areas and in those each of those decision points. Uh, so we talked a little bit, we opened up for discussion earlier with some of these same questions. Uh, as you've seen, as, you, as you've kind of walked through, uh, what does it mean to operationalize this work? Um, you know, we talked a little bit about some of the priorities that have jumped out for you. Um, are, are there more questions you have knowing that we're running uh, into our last 20 minutes um, and we've got a few more slides to kind of walk through some specifics of what this might look like, what governance might look like. Um, but wanted to pause and see if you have more questions for Susan and I right now, um, or if you'd like us to keep kind of digging into the slides we have in front. Are there more questions from folks? Uh, I see one hand up. Are there other? All I have is number 11 on my screen. I can't tell whether or not. Okay. Uh, just uh, really quickly, and uh, we are going to receive the rest of these slides. Well, they hopefully the, the complete presentation. Uh, there is other. There is another piece of work before uh, the continuity of care uh, uh, meeting ends today. I want to thank you for coming and. Uh, and sharing with us, so. Thank you, that's great.
this, if anyone has any last questions, this is a good time to do it. Not seeing any, uh, thanks again. And uh, we'll move on to just the last piece of, for today. And that is the first biannual continuum of care board meeting. We should have two, I'm sorry, Tamara, I can't hear you. Okay, uh, we'll be on uh, May 14th. It'll be a virtual affair. It'll be a half day, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. in the afternoon. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, the, the objects for the meeting will be shared with folks here within a week or so, within the week, so that we'll know uh, the plan for the four hours. It does seem like it'll be starting off with updates, and then we'll be, have an opportunity to break out in work groups uh, to actually start tackling some of the work in front of us. You won't have any questions? Which I really can't see. One of these days really soon, I'm gonna get on a big screen and be able to see everybody. As, as part of our uh, group work, uh, I wanted to always make sure we leave 10 or 15 minutes for us as a board to discuss either what we've heard or if there are questions we need to, we want to start asking. Um, so I want to open up the floor for that. I think for me personally, I, I'm just curious to know if we're going to be um, looking at replacing the members who've left or are we just going to be this entity with three less members or what 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 are we going to do with that <laughs> it is my hope that we will replace our empty seats uh, we've added a lot of things we've wanted to be part of our board we don't want to lose our our area specific seats such as making sure south end is included clearly on our board and in our discussions uh, the big, uh, we want to make sure we have another uh, funder seat filled, hopefully one that can, will align with where, what we find important and be able to help us achieve those goals. So, uh, Do we then, have a template of an application or any of that for those three positions that we do have open? Or is that something that we have to create to open those up for people to apply? Well, I, um, I was encouraged, well, when I came onto the board, I was encouraged to apply and that meant sending a resume in. And it was uh, from someone who was already a board member, but it, I think it could be anybody. What we need to decide to do hopefully is uh, somehow be able to make public that we're looking to fulfill seats on the continuum of care and that uh, if folks wish to uh, be part of it, that they uh, send a resume. I think we need to be clear yeah, about absolutely. what seats we're trying to fill. And the last one I was struggling with was uh, a seat that uh, clearly had incarceration uh, and its impact on issues in our area being clearly defined. Uh, Miss Jesse's input on that. So uh, we can, uh, I don't, we can take a few minutes today and figure out if we want to ask uh, our staffers if they want to make an announcement on the website. Uh, and yeah, so does all our board members know the three positions that are open? Is, that, is everybody clear that's present today, clear on what those positions are? Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering if there is an opportunity no. to, to be flexible. So instead of maybe asking like a resume, people could provide 
you know, information about why and, and their background. So just making it flexible because not everyone has a resume. So maybe thinking about just accessibility on how- Yeah, I, I agree with you. I didn't sign, when I got this, I didn't fill out uh, an application or turn in a resume. There was just some basic questions that I was asked in regards to like, like you said, like why I want to be here, like what my equity stuff was, my experience, things like that. So I agree with you. That's why I was asking. I thought we had some form of template that was kind of just a foundation of, of maybe like some of what we what we are looking for. Anyways, yeah. Marvin, somebody said they didn't know the three positions. So can you please uh, tell us the, the three that we have? We have a funder seat, right? Open. Yes. And uh, then have, what are the other uh, two? Oh, wow. Uh, we have the uh, Jesse seat, which was his primary, uh, his focus was always incarceration and, and its impacts on systems or responses uh, throughout. Okay. Uh, and then did you say we have the South too? Is that it? South, South King thank County? you very much. Yes. Uh, someone that represents the South then is clearly knowledgeable and can oh. speak to the inequities in which uh, the King County system response system presently uh, it is at and where we want to go and how we expand the regional response to the entire region, not uh, so centric such as Seattle, Bellevue, blah, 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 but to the region. So. Right. Those are the three that I so know. So those are the three one. seats, you guys. The founder seat. One for incarcerated persons and that representation of that population, um, people who are incarcerated and coming out from, right, reentry, And then the South King County one um, that we want them to kind of be um, an expert in those inequities and services that are lacking or therefore in strengths hey, out there hey, as well. Shanae, are you saying uh, founder or funder? Oh, the, the funder, sorry. Funder seat, Am I okay. cutting out? No, I just, I thought, uh, I thought it was a funder seat, but I thought I heard you say founder. It could be my sorry. earphones too. That's okay. Um, so those are the three that um, have left and that are open. Um, and I would also like feedback if there's any like specific questions that you guys think um, that we should be asking all um, applicants and then um, piggy banking off of what Marvin said, I'd ask um, our, like, um, I'd ask for the the people to, um, like, we need to create like a posting, right? And then post that, whether that's like on our website, King County, the LEC, things like that, where it could actually be in the public's view. Um, and, and then again, announce it at our regular uh, public meetings that we have as well. Where's the funder criteria listed? Could you send me a link, please, somebody? This, just to, to jump in here, the, the uh, charter that we received is the, is the older one. So, you know, one of the things that I have asked for uh, from, uh, from our partners at the city and county is, you know, can, a copy of the latest charter because that was not one of one of the materials that came to us. I did get from uh, the consultant who worked with you all about a year ago, Michelle Valdez, a charter that was dated of December 2020, and I shared that um, with Marvin to validate that that's the current one. And I just, you know, right. so I'm I'm happy to circulate that one, but I it, I I just wanted a little bit of like, I, you know, that not having would serve for it. now, Peter. That's the one with all that, yeah. yeah. That would serve for right now. It isn't after uh, going through it and after being able to talk to some other folks. It doesn't reflect the last uh, amendments Our made amendment. by the exiting uh, continuum care board. I uh, see. Which I were see. not validated until January. Uh, is it? Been, right. Just before you guys were hired. And it, I, I believe that we will be able to uh, 
I'm, I'm now confident we'll be able to secure those amendments and dates because I've chatted with some folks and I'm looking forward to receiving the minutes from the final Wonderful. Uh, couple meetings. I was going to say, because we amended that. We have, where's our paper? We, we voted on some things. We changed some wording. Um, we changed some rules in regards to that beforehand. And so we need the most updated one. That's what you're talking about, right, Marvin? Yes. We, yes. Yeah, we got to find that. Okay. We worked too hard on that little bit of work. So. Okay. So but Marvin, getting the, a copy of it is just the piece that we will have. Hopefully, maybe we can have it by our uh, biannual meeting. Uh, at, the turnaround will not be quick enough for May's meeting, if nothing less. Is it not my understanding that the people who came before Peter and all of them is the ones who was documenting our meetings then? Why, where's the minutes from that? Uh, that was, there was a drop, there was a drop off of the exit and continue of care board staffing and then who was actually managing our meetings oh, in the no. beginning. See? So, and that's, a simple, that is the challenge is bridging that gap and hopefully we will have all that we need from that piece uh, so we can start our, you know, we learned a little bit today about the work and getting it started is what's up next. Right. So. Okay. Anybody else you. have questions, comments, or concerns? Yeah, back to the position of funder. If somebody has just a brief description of what the funder criteria needs to be to meet our board appointment, could you say that or list that or uh, shoot me an email or a link where I could look? I'm great at fundraising and I am thinking of a few people. Chrissy, I, I just wanted to. Go ahead. Just wanted to point out that the that the definition is embedded in the charter. That's what we were just talking about. We want to make sure we have the final final charter before we share that language out, so that you know, no, there's no confusion. I was. Uh, that's why. I that's asked what you that. were addressing that's me. Right. Okay, that's I didn't. You didn't yeah. address me directly. I wondered. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So I've got the same and, definition that everybody else has. Great. And if Ben's still on the line, I can't really see on my list. If Ben is still with us. I am. Hello. Uh, do you happen to know what the actual language is around a funding seat? I don't remember the exact language. I know there were a lot of conversations about it. The, the intent was to have someone connected to the entities that fund homelessness services. So um, a representative of one of the um, philanthropic organizations um, or potentially one of the, the government funders um, just to make sure that those perspectives get included. What about somebody that from an independent philanthropic point of view? Are we against that? I think for, I, think, I, I believe, not necessarily what we're for or against, but that the intent of the, the provision was just to ensure that as long as that, that funder is funding the services in this system that we're discussing, I think you're right, Ben. I think we kind of left it general, right? Yeah. That way, it would have people would have more opportunity um, to apply. I think we kind of left that in general um, language because we didn't want to ostracize particular certain populations or people. Okay. Do you know? You want to know what's on my uh, what, what's going through my brain, my favorite brain here? <laughs> There's a couple that had raised. Uh, $143,000 to build a tiny home in South Lake Union, and there was too much politicking going on. So retired couple live at Mirabella, and they ended up getting nowhere with it, and so they had to give the money back. Well, this couple is an elder couple, so they would they would get the elderly vote from me. I'm an elder as well. They've got do-gooder genes in them, obviously, and $150,000 is nothing to sneeze at. So maybe these people might be good additions to our board. I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there because I like this article. I, I put the link in the chat if anybody wants to read it. But it just seems like we've got people willing to help, willing to you know become part of what we're trying to do. We shouldn't ignore them. So that's my two cents there, you guys. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, multiple applicants um, putting forth 
um, their best selves to apply for the position, no matter what they are and what seat they um, are qualified for. And then us as a board being able to um, go through them. I don't, I mean, I think this is, that's the opportunity is that we want to have as many applicants and participants so that there is diversity and that there is a, and a quality of um, applicants that we can go through, right? Okay. Yeah, I don't know these people from Adam, but I'm sure willing to talk to them. Let them know. Well, I have talked to them, and it was very interesting, their story. Oh, could see the guy from the, that was a space center manager at Kent, Boeing? It, it wasn't what they did for a living. It wasn't what, right. uh, what their right. intent was to do. It was the lack of an access point for them to carry through the right. work that they so they work so hard to raise. Right, right. Uh, yeah, that's what I the want to says. make yeah. sure that ongoing systems do not reflect those points of access that would be helpful from the general community that are already working to uh, help us end this problem. But we should go uh, talk to them, Marvin. You and I should. should uh, I've once again spoke with them. They, they did a whole lot, they, they reached out to a lot of organizations to try to figure out the best course. They did you just go speak didn't to them find as a representative one and they were frustrated. So it's not an ongoing conversation. It is a shame that that money has been returned to it, the folks that gave it and that we didn't provide any shelter with it. And we can, as a group here, start looking at ways that our system is uh, flexible enough that we can reach it. We, we can help folks like that when they show up. Now you're sounding like a politician, Marvin. Did you, did you talk to them? <laughs> did you talk to them as a member of the advisory board? No, I talked to them okay. as a uh, staff person for Nicholsville, which I have no public voice for. Right. However, now that group sat down with them and told them how their villages ran. And they said at present that they too were not getting any funding from any source. Right. That's where and I work from. When we're not going from Lehigh, we would go as advisory board co-members. I'm not Lehigh. I, I don't can, represent I said, Lehigh, I said, nor I are tiny that. houses Marvin, all hush, Lehigh's. Listen to me. I said we're not Lehigh. You need to listen okay. when I talk, please. You're, you're already thinking in your head that I'm talking. You're not listening to what I'm saying. We, we go to these people and tell them we're advisory board members. You've got great ideas. Would you care to be on this board? That's my thinking. That's where I'm coming from. These people have a lot of energy and time and effort, and they want the same thing that we do. We're wasting resources here by just letting them fly through our fingers. You don't go to them as the representative of hoo-ha or hoo-ha. Just, hi, I'm from the advisory committee. I read your article. You came up in our board meeting. How would you like to be a part of this? That's one-on-one -on -one talking to community members, Marvin. It's not for Lehigh. It's not for anybody else. So if that's what you wanted to talk to me about after the meeting, the next time you say that, please, when I call you, I expect you to call me back. Please, I've called you a million times, and you're very not well received at calling me back. It's real hard to get in contact with you. Yeah, and I have, that's another that issue and while we're still being recorded. It's on tape now, so there you go. Thank you, that's all I have to say. Good stuff. Is there anything else for the good of the order today? I wanna thank everyone for uh, showing up. Uh, this is hopefully our let's move forward spot. So uh, I'll see everyone next week for our regular meeting. Hopefully we'll have an agenda out by Friday, but uh, we'll, we'll work hard to see that that gets done. Thank you. Right. Nice. Wonderful. Hey, Naomi.